We try and isolate them from friends and family. They'll become their main source of financial support often. And a lot of times, I'm sorry, a lot of times they will convince them to run away and live with them. And some of these youth from broken homes may not have other options um, when they run away, so they might stay with their perpetrator. And that perpetrator will make them feel safe there. And then the manipulation stage also includes a lot of emotional language, emotional actions to move themselves to being in the position of being their main and only source of emotional support and love. And then once they know that that child relies on them for both emotional support and physical needs, they'll start to convince that child that they cannot live without them. And then this is when they're just going to start introducing pornography and more extensive physical contact because they want to start to desensitize them to that. So in 1943, psychologist Abraham Maslow introduced his hierarchy of needs pyramid. And this is really well known in the field of psychology. And this pyramid depicts all human needs. So the reason I included this is because I want to show you how pimps meet every single one of these needs. So if you start at the bottom, bottom this physiological needs, the, the pimp is going to provide food, shelter, clothing, and basic needs. Going up to safety, they offer them protection against abuse. A lot of times these kids are from abuse, abusive home lives, abusive families, um, and they offer financial security. Because a lot of these children, if we're talking 12 to 14 year olds, they can't get a job. So the pimp is taking care of them, shelter financially, and then love and belonging. So they're gonna spend time with them, offer them love and support, and you know, treat them like a girlfriend. And then esteem, they give them compliments, they flatter them, they give them gifts, and then self-actualization. I can't tell you how many of those memoirs that I've read of survivors, which there's just a handful, but they said they, you know, their pimp promised them that he would marry them and they would have a family and they'd have a white picket fence someday. So they're thinking this whole time that he loves me, he loves me, he loves me. So essentially traffickers are experts at fulfilling all these basic needs. They identify the needs of the child, they fulfill those needs, they remove any other sources of need fulfillment, and then they'll exploit that child's dependence on this need for fulfillment by forcing them into being trafficked. Okay, and then um, once a trafficker feels like that victim is bonded to him, he'll turn her out. That's the lingo, turn her out. Start to prostitute her. And this is the stage where the trafficker gains complete control over his victim's mind and body. He'll verbally and physically abuse the child and get her addicted to alcohol or drugs. And sometimes, if he can, he will completely alienate her from any outside contact, friends, family. Um, sometimes pimps have stables, which is groups of girls. They call each other wives-in-law. And they may only be able to communicate with each other, but he pits them against each other and uses physical and emotional violence so that they can't become, they don't become friends, their allegiance is to him above all. So they're lacking that emotional support too, even if they're around other girls. I think these pictures are really telling because once they're victims, the, the pimp considers them property. And he will actually mark or brand uh, his stable of girls. Um, and sometimes they're extensive, sometimes they're, they're not, but often on the neck. This one girl's on her face, says loyalty. Um, and they really go to great lengths to convince the victims no one would want to help them, even if they asked. They have no self-esteem, they have no self-worth. They're told that the, the police won't believe them. The police are corrupt. The trafficker has links to the police. The victim will be arrested. And they'll tell them that if they try to escape, they'll harm their family or friends. So they always have that hanging over their heads too. So what's life for a victim? A day in the life. Um, every situation is different, of course, um, but these are some of the typical things that they have to deal with on a daily basis. They often work very long hours being sold for sex. They are often beaten, raped. They see an average of 10 to 30 sex buyers every day. Uh, they're given a quota every day that they need to fulfill. It's usually $1,000 to $1,500. If they don't meet their quota, they're beaten or they're sent back out. And of course the pimp takes all the money. 
And their lives are really filled with violence, and so a lot of them do become suicidal. So this quote really reiterates what I showed you um, on Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Pyramid. The trafficker becomes the victim's everything, and the victim wants to be his everything. So you will do anything to feel like his everything, and he promises you everything. And the things he convinces you to do, they don't seem that bad if afterwards he shows you how much he loves you. As long as your profits meet his expectations, you'll have what you've wanted your whole life, which is love. And that was written by a survivor. So why can't they leave? And this is very similar to domestic violence situations. But, you know, they suffer devastating physical, mental, and emotional trauma. I mean, trauma is really the key word here. Um, they're trapped by fear and shame. They may be addicted to drugs. A lot of times in Wisconsin, that's going to be heroin. And even though their quality of life is terrible, they're still completely connected to their trafficker, which is often called the trauma bond or Stockholm syndrome. And essentially what a trauma bond is, is although the victim is subjected to cycles and cycles of violence, the trafficker interrupts those cycles with acts of kindness and love. So he'll get her a gift or he'll you know, show her love in some way to just keep her hooked, keep her hooked. And usually the victim doesn't have other human contacts, so there's no other perspective uh, to consider. And they feel there's no way to escape. So their minds are really becoming traumatized. Um, but psychologically, the victims don't realize this, but that emotional bonding to their captor is actually a psychological strategy for survival. However, if they do survive and escape, it's incredibly hard to de-traumatize them and break that trauma bond. And on top of the trauma bond, a victim's emotional state tells her she is actually at fault. Okay? She doesn't deserve a better life than this. Most victims don't think they're victims. They have no self-worth, no reason for help, hope. Their attitudes and core beliefs are so distorted, it's almost as if they're living in a cult and need to be reprogrammed. So Girls Like Us is a very powerful memoir. It's back there if you want to take a look at it before you leave. Um, but she's a survivor. This is her memoir. And this passage, I think, is so poignant, and it says so much about a pimp and a victim relationship. So she says, I know that he knows everything about me, past, present, and future. I know he is all-powerful, all-knowing, and no matter where I go, he's there. Even when I run away, he finds me and either punishes me or cajoles me into forgiving him. He feels like a part of my skin. He's in my bloodstream. When he tells me that even if I get married, have children, I'm gone for 10 years, he'll find me. I believe him. When he says that I'll have no choice but to go with him, that I'll always belong to him, that I was born to be his, I believe him. So now we're going to talk about signs of a victim. And there's cards in your packets. If anyone didn't get one of the black folders with the handouts, there are more handouts in the very back. I just didn't have time to put them all in folders. But there's extra little uh, business-sized cards in there, and there are no the red flags of human tra or of sex trafficking. So the, the the cards list all of this information, but basically they show signs of abuse. Um, they can't come and go as they wish. They have an older boyfriend. They may have multiple hotel keys or IDs. All of a sudden, they have a lot of expensive stuff. They carry multiple phones. They're late from school or absent from school. Um, and they appear disconnected with family and friends. Um, suddenly, they have you know, a change of behavior, a ch change of attire. Um, and they seem to be controlled and not in control of their schedule. They're inconsistent, and they also often have signs of exhaustion, anxiety, fear, depression. For labor trafficking, um, signs of a victim would be that they appear malnourished, they avoid eye contact, they seem afraid, shy, anxious, they don't speak much, if at all. They can't identify where they live, they don't have money, they don't have ID. They're often accompanied by a third person. They have unmet medical needs, and they often are living in crowded homes with multiple people. Okay, so I think the most powerful way to um, have a lasting impact talking about human trafficking is talking about actual real life examples. So as I mentioned, I went to the Outagamie County Human, Tra Task Human Trafficking Task Force meeting, progress update. 
um, that was a few weeks ago, and they talked about this girl named Paige. Paige is 14. She's, well, I'm sorry, she's 16 now, but she was 14 at the time. She's white. She goes to Appleton Public Schools. And the police officer told us the story about how he met Paige and got involved with her. She had troubles at home. She had troubles at school. Um, in June of 2015, she was being sold for sex out of a Motel 6 in Appleton. There's actually a lot of sex trafficking around the Fox River Mall in Appleton. There's about 22 hotels there, I think. Uh, she was 14 years old at the time, and her pimp had got her addicted to heroin. So the police staged a raid, and they were able to rescue her at the time. They found her and another girl who was 17 from Green Bay, and she told them that she'd been sold for sex to men, um, for, to 18 men, before they came and arrested them. She said she needed money to pay her pimp who threatened her. And um, she, the suspected pimp was arrested at the time, and I don't know the de details of what happened there, but I'll never forget how this police officer described him. He said the entire time they were there, this pimp was looking at Paige, and it was like he was staring into her soul. Everywhere she moved, he just followed her. He had complete control. And they did get her out, but she, they got her out of the life three times, but she's run back to him three times. And the average time, or an average number of times it takes for them to escape is six. So because of that trauma bond and everything else that's, that I've been talking about, it's very, very difficult for them to leave. So I'm gonna show another, just a little blip about real life examples. at Mortal Life, and you guys know that. It's victim services and prevention. And victim services, all the trauma-informed care and the aftercare and all these activities and stuff you guys do and need to heal. I know Don and Emily want to hear what you really have to say. There's someone out there that doesn't get the opportunity to hear the message. We all have a story to tell, but we're afraid sometimes to tell them. I started being sexually abused when I was a child the age of seven until um, I was 14. After that, I kind of just checked out on life. You know what I mean? I was confused, I was hurt, I was lost. I didn't understand why it happened or, you know, how to fix it. Um, I got involved in drugs and, you know, kind of self-medicated. When I was 17, I met my first Trafficker, pimp, whatever you want to call him. I was molested when I was three years old. I finally told somebody when I was eight years old. We're here, we're strong women, you know, and we can we can start to get a, a life, you know, and I'm a survivor. My trafficker, I was actually with for six years, and at first, he was my boyfriend and never put his hands on me for the first two years. Like, a lot of these girls that are being trafficked don't realize that that's what it is because I didn't until I got here. I just thought I was, a, you know, a prostitute and he was my boyfriend, but that's not the case, you know. And I just want girls to know that, that that's not love. And I was able, thanks to Dr. Bello and Mr. Derrick and More to Life, to get a chance at a, a new life, like just a new start. Okay, I'm running way behind, so I'm gonna start to talk a little more quickly and go through slides. Um, but the buyers of the Johns, who are these guys? Okay, there's not a lot of statistics on them about demographics. 83% say they're addicted to sex. Um, it used to be Backpage.com, and it still is a little bit, but the federal government took down the escort section of Backpage.com a couple months ago, which is a very proactive measure, and we'll see if that helps. But there's so many other online ways that buyers can get a hold of pimp cell phone numbers, and then they have them, and they can you know, be repeat buyers and feed that demand. Um, and then for punishment, uh, I just wanted to do an example of, of what's being done about Johns. Not much in Wisconsin. I think the statistic I read was 99% of Johns are, there's no you know, action at all. But out of Gamey County, um, they really are stepping up. There's a lot of awareness in the Appleton area. 
And what they do is they will uh, arrest them, find them $1,200 to $2,100. They're put on probation for a year and they're required to attend a John school. And the John school has actually worked pretty well. Um, a lot of them don't realize what's happening to these young women. Um, okay, so our wonderful Attorney General, Brad Schimmel, I think this is very um, encouraging. And this was last year, he said, here's a message to all the Johns, we're coming for you. And he talks about that they're gonna educate law enforcement in every area of the state to go after these guys. Legislation, I'm gonna breeze through. International legislation, there's two, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Palermo Convention. Um, United States federal legislation. And again, I can email this to anybody who wants all the details and all my notes are in there too. Um, but there's some older ones. Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 is very, very um, instrumental in a lot of the legislation that's being done today. Um, Sister Frances talked about that. And then um, the two most recent ones are the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act. And that's important. That was in 2014 because that says that every state has to develop um, policies, procedures, response protocols for helping victims of trafficking. And the Wisconsin Department of Children and Families has a three-tier, three three-year plan that you can read about online what they're doing. The End Modern Slavery Initiative was just signed into law, and that's another um, collaborative effort. In Wisconsin, we do have two human trafficking statutes that are very solid legislation. Um, and we also have Act 367, which was just signed into law last April. And that requires agencies to report children used for sex trafficking or prostitution as victims, not prostitution. If they're under 18, they are victims. And most of them who are over 18 are victims as well. Um, but under those statutes, we have some really good um, crimes to go after these guys. The problem is you can't find them. <laughs> It's so hard to identify them, apprehend them, prosecute the traffickers, is who we're talking about now, and then even harder to get a victim to testify against these guys. So we've had 12, as far as I know, 12 convicted with these two <coughs> statutes, ever. However, there's a lot of really proactive things going on, especially in the last couple of years. Um, these are three pimps who were arrested. Um, I'm not going to go into their stories, but you can see one's Wausau, one's Sparta, one's Milwaukee. It's everywhere in Wisconsin. Pimpin' Paul Carter was just his sentences this month that we'll hear. And he was, he had eight victims out of Milwaukee. There are also a lot of task forces, and this is really exciting. These are a lot of professionals that are coming together, and they're, you know, in, some are Wisconsin-wide, some are county-wide, and they're really focusing on the response mechanism. How do we build this infrastructure to help these victims get out of the life? There's also a national effort called FBI Operation Cross Country. Last year, they had 82 minors rescued and 239 traffickers and their associates rescued. That's a three-day operation in the United States. So it's really, really exciting federal things that are happening. Um, okay, I have nine minutes left, so I'm not gonna read through this. Um, <laughs> but she's, Rachel Wood is just basically talking about the mental state of victims and how difficult it is to get out of the life, which we kind of already talked about anyways. But there is a chart in your folders and there's some extra in the back. I developed this chart to show you, and this is really probably the most important thing you can take away from you, is how a victim is showing what a victim of sex trafficking is dealing with, okay? And how they would get out of the life. So you start with the at-risk youth circle, the orange one on the left. And then you can go to, you have the influences. You have the perpetrators who are going after them, but then you also have your parents and your families and the educators. And then the general public. And what you can do is listed in that bullet. And that's what I'll go through in this little time we have left. But it's all listed there too on the chart. They become an exploited victim. Then it's that crisis event. Something has to happen. They end up in the hospital. They end up arrested. Something violent happens. Um, their, their child is abducted. And then that's when they can break through that bond of the trafficker. The trafficker is blocking their interaction with the rest of the world. That's how they enter the service system usually. At one of those points, law enforcement, medical, child welfare system, etc. And the most important takeaway from this, well, two things, is one, they need immediate crisis counseling. 
because if they're interviewed too early, they're already completely overwhelmed being in this situation. They need to feel safe. And if they're asked to tell their stories immediately, and this happens with law enforcement, that can result in re-traumatization and a lot of more anxiety and psychological difficulties. Media crisis counseling and the second thing is a safe house. And there are a few safe houses in Wisconsin, but not many, and we're working on it. But to me, those are the critical things that are needed to help them get out of the life. So this is just talking more about um, the crisis counseling that's needed. The safe house, the victims need a safe house to stay. They need a stable environment with a myriad of services to meet their very complex needs. Now in the past, sexual assault crisis centers, youth homeless shelters, um, other service organizations have helped some of these women get out of the life, which is wonderful. But a lot of them are not trained specifically for victims of human trafficking. So we need more safe houses like I Heart World that they're talking about. They're opening their Rose House in Brown County this year, which is phenomenal. And they have such a good program. And they have all these volunteer counselors and attorneys and medical professionals, and they're all trauma-informed. So that's going to make a huge difference in Brown County. Um, there's also a couple others. Grateful Girls Safe Haven in Milwaukee, Lad Lake. There's one opening up on the south side of Milwaukee, some sisters are opening that, and then Freedom House. If you Google online, there's a couple efforts underway. Um, but they really need basic needs, medical services, counseling, mentoring is really critically important. They need social support, emotional support. It really helps if survivors are involved in that. There are a lot of survivor-led programs in the United States. It really helps them heal. So really, the infrastructure needed comes down to four things to eradicate human trafficking, is raising awareness so the general public knows about it and knows what to do about it. And then, in particular, being proactive with parents and teachers, teaching girls self-worth, teaching boys that women should not be um, objectified, adequately educating law enforcement and the courts in acting laws to protect victims and uphold justice, justice against traffickers and sex buyers, and then providing adequate services for victims and survivors. So what you can do Educate yourself and others. Obviously, you're here today doing that. Follow, you know, sign up for e-newsletters. Follow on Facebook, um, anti-trafficking organizations. Two of the best are U.S. Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking. They send regular updates on email. They make it easy for you. They just send them on email. I, that's where I get the majority of my information is from their e-newsletter. Polaris is an amazing resource, resource for that as well. And this information is on your chart. So I'm not going to go too greatly in detail. Um, volunteer, you know, choose organizations that are out there. There's a map online. The Wisconsin Anti-Human Trafficking Consortium has a map of agencies that you can look at. Very important advocacy, why we're here today. Um, you know, know who your representatives are. We have two um, United States senators and your uh, U.S. Rep representative. I'm getting ahead of myself. And then obviously, um, everyone's represented by a state senator and a state assembly representative. So there's 33 Senate districts and 99 assembly districts. And that's what this from the red folder is in. So you can go and talk to them today. Three points to talk to them about human trafficking, because you want to be very concise when you're talking with policymakers. One is lack of safe housing for victims to recover. This is Wisconsin. Two is lack of convictions for traffickers. Twelve is pitiful. Three is lack of arrest and prosecution for John, so we can end the demand side of this. So if you do go over, and I encourage you to go over, I've done it before, it's very simple, very easy, five minute conversation. Having that in presence, you know, talk, that discussion with your representatives is very, very powerful. Don't be intimidated by it, I really encourage you to do that. They need to know that people are concerned about human trafficking. And then another thing is they make it really easy to report suspicious activity now. There's apps you can get on your phone, one's called Red Light Traffic, and you can, if you see a situation that you think is suspicious, the police want you to call their non-emergency line and let them know. But you could do it even easier and have it on your phone, and then Red Light Traffic will report it, and you can take pictures and send it to them. And obviously to pray for them, pray for the victims, the potential victims, pray for conversion of traffickers. The Human Trafficking Parish Toolkit I was involved in, we mailed one of these to every parish in Wisconsin last year. And 
some of them were on the tables earlier, so you, can, you saw what was inside that. I can email any of those components to anyone who wants them. If you want to see what are, I have a couple examples up here if you want to see other things that are in there. And then the sex trafficking, labor trafficking infographics, and the resources sheet that's back there and also in your black folders. Make sure to take a look at that because those are very specific for Wisconsin resources for Wisconsin. Okay, I'm wrapping up, I promise. Um, and then there's a section too on what your parish can do. You know, obviously hold presentation, uh, assist local service providers, volunteer with them, donate with them. Um, I'm gonna end because I'm out of time. But my, the final slides are resources. So organizations I would really encourage you to support. I Heart World in Green Bay is phenomenal. They are a model organization, Five Stones in Appleton. Project Respect right here in Madison is phenomenal. They do direct services for victims and they do offer temporary safe housing. Exploit No More, Grateful Girls, Slavery Madison. Internationally, I would say Shared Hope, Polaris, and the US Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking are the leading organizations, um, really model organizations. And then I did put the example books there and I listed them here as well. And one other thing, American Crime is a TV series, and this season is focused on human trafficking, and it's very powerful. Um, they've had three episodes so far. It's Sunday nights at 9. I don't remember the channel, but American Crime. That is, what is it? ABC. ABC. That is a very powerful way that we're going to be able to educate a lot of people. Um, so I just like to end with this quote, I'm only one but still I am one. I cannot do everything but I can still do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. And I'm sorry I had to go so quickly through the second half, but please take my business card. It's in your packets. Contact me. If you have questions, you can come at, up now. I think I am out of time. <laughs> Thank you. as the perpetrators do, but that we should use it to the positive good. Um, that we should pay attention to what's right under our noses and know the signs, and then also meet the hierarchy of needs in whatever larger big ways that we can so that young people don't have to look to um, other avenues to meet those hierarchy of needs. So again, we thank you for that wisdom and all the things that we've gained. Um, Loette, would you do me a favor? Would you put, do you have a blank sheet left in your folder? Would you put that on the back table? And anyone who would like to have Emily email them for PowerPoint or any of that information, please put your name and email address on the, on the sheet that will be in the back, and she can do that more effectively then for you. So thank you. The next thing, uh, 245 afternoon general session, and then we'll be back in the big room where we started, uh, where we were at at lunch. <laughs>